Before we get started, I just want to say thanks to everyone that's helping me get uh, people wrangled together for the podcast. Getting a nice uh, group of people ready for interviews to be published and to actually be performed. Um, So I just want to thank those of you, uh, you know who you are. Thank you very much for helping out. Um, This week, uh, we're taking a, a dive into... Uh, a software package, not Max, but uh, very much of the modular vein. I hope that you enjoy my discussion with Jim Coker. Okay, this week we have a very special guest, uh, Jim Coker from 512, the developers of the numerology software. Uh, among my modular using friends, numerology is a very, very popular software package. Uh, but it's also very defining in that it, it found a way to you know, very uniquely merge the, sort of the analog of the digital worlds. And so I think it's pretty fantastic software, and I, I'm excited to be able to talk to Jim. So, hi, Jim. How are you? I'm good. That's a very nice introduction. Oh, well, uh, it's, uh, it's easy to give you a nice introduction because I'm a big fan of your work. Before we uh, before we dive into the Q and A, uh, for those people who maybe don't know that much about the numerology software, why don't you uh, why don't I have you give us a quick overview on what what's what that is? Okay, so it's it's sequencing software for the Mac, and uh, a lot of programs that are sequencers use a piano roll type of metaphor for organizing things, and that's grown over the years to become what's called a digital audio workstation. And numerology's approach is very different. It, it, it grows out of the use of hardware and analog modulars and so forth. So it is a, a virtual modular system that runs a software, but it's focused on sequencing. And it has seven or eight modules specifically for sequencing and then a whole bunch of other modules to uh, allow those sequencing modules to do interesting things. And uh, there are sequencers that are very, very much like analog sequencers. They generate... Uh, what would be called CV in the analog world, meaning control voltage, and I call it the same thing, but it's control value in the computer. And there are sequencers that generate MIDI. And all the sequencers are step sequencers, meaning that uh, the sequence is comprised of a series of steps, and each step has a certain length and maybe a pitch or some other value. And the, the interesting part is how you can manipulate how the sequencer plays through those steps. So you can skip steps, you can move forwards and backwards, you can have it randomly jump from one step to another instead of going sequentially. Um, And the the whole idea is that it's an an iterative process that you start with a simple sequence and you just start modifying it, modifying it, modifying it, and you can have several of them going at once and you can move between them and you you don't have to stop the transport, you know, you don't, it's all seamless. So it's this, you know, it's this composition of activity. And um, that was what I was after when I built it. And, and, you know, and with, when working with a modular, it's kind of that same thing, right? You start with something and you just keep iterating and iterating. And it's this whole process about creating it. It's very, very different from working with a linear sequencer where, you know, you record some things, you stop, you think about it, you, keep, you do it again. And that's a, a really good work process, but it's a different work process. Right. Well, it's... Uh... Typically in my podcasts, what I do is I start off by asking people to give me something in their background. But because of what numerology is, I'm actually like really, really interested in the in the answer uh, to that. Because it's clear that this has been informed by a lot of different uh, backgrounds. You know, you, uh, some of it is really oriented towards hardware-like processes, some of it software-like. So why don't you tell me a little bit about your background so I can understand a little more about where this thing came from? Yeah. Well, there there are basically two sides to that. Um, part of that is the technical side, because most of my official education is in computer science. It didn't quite start that way, but uh, I had a Mac when I was in high school, and I started to teach myself how to program. And back then... It was a a 128K Mac, if you remember those, and there wasn't a lot in the way of programming tools, but I started with a language called Forth and learned how to do that, and over the years, that developed and developed, and that that was my primary career was uh, software development. It still is, but now it's software development for music. Um, 
And along the way, I, I was also very interested in all kinds of different arts and things. So I was in high school band and a little bit of college band. In, in college, I got into actually poetry writing for a while, which has this weird correlation with writing code because you're looking at stuff on a, either on a page or on a screen, and it, it, there's a certain similarity there in the, in the aesthetic of how it looks and how you work with it. Um, at some point in college, I got to become a you know, relatively serious music collector. It was right when CDs were becoming more and more available and all these new things were coming out and being released. And uh, me and my roommate at the time were collecting a lot of like classic, romantic, classical stuff, as well as a lot of you know typical college radio stuff. And I met a guy who started to turn me on to really, really early music, like everything from uh, Palestrina and Bach and Hildegard von Bingen, and really, really modern stuff like Schoenberg and Berg, and everything up to Cage and, and Subotnik, and. That was kind of an enduring passion for quite a while, and still is. But, you know, at the time, I was just listening to it like, wow, this is crazy. How do they do this? You know? And, and you know, at the time, I knew about synthesizers, but I didn't know much about them. And then uh, at some point, I got a regular job, and I started to get a little music equipment here and there. And um, I met a friend, uh, still a very good friend in Peoria, named Eric Williamson. You know him as Suit and Tie Guy. He makes modules yes. now. Right. And um, he had started doing these really low-key, improvised electronic music shows in Peoria. And I was like, that sounds like fun. I should do that. So, you know, got some equipment together and went down. And I think we only did maybe three official shows total. Uh, we did a lot of studio work together. And um, I was using a lot of different things. I was all over the place. You know, I... Um, I used Max early on before MSP was available. Um, I had a Kima system for a while. I used Super Collider, Reactor. Um, at one point, I was even writing some Java code to do kind of some basic sequencing and arpeggiating stuff. Um, and it kind of just all rolled around, you know, not in any particular direction. And then after OS X Jaguar came out, when, it, when it, they first had a really good audio subsystem, uh, that would be OS 10.2. So I, I think that dates that pretty well. Right. But uh, I had some free time. I just finished uh, a consulting job. So I wasn't really fired, but there wasn't really any work, and I was okay for money. And I thought, you know, I'm really interested in doing some serious music programming with this new stuff. And uh, so I thought, hey, I'll, I'll do my own little step sequencer. I've been trying to do that for a while. I, uh, this will take a few months and then I'll go back to the regular job. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, eight or ten months later, I did uh, release Numerology 1, and shockingly, people started buying it. And, you know, and you don't think about it necessarily. Well, I didn't when I, when I first did it. I was just, I, was, I wanted to get this thing done. So it was like an art project, right? Right, right. Um, you're not thinking about, oh, I'm going to, you know, sell a, a bunch of them. You're more like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have this idea. I need to get it out. And I got it out. People started buying it and giving me feedback. And then the next thing you know, it's this you know, rather extended project. And, uh, um, you know, and I'm always going back to those initial influences, like the, the music I was listening to, uh, the other tools I'd used and the things that I really like, but, you know, I want to do it a different way. And, how the users are using it and what they're finding. And, you know, it's just this kind of mix of all these different techniques. Um, you know, a big breakthrough for me was the launch pad mapping, which is, you know, the 8x8 grid controller. And it's very easy to write software to it, so you can use the controller as a grid for the software. And it, it just so happened that it's excellent for programming MIDI sequences with. Sure, sure. Um, and... Uh, and I, you know, and I, when I started writing for it, I had no idea how useful and, and, and interesting a, an approach that would be. So that, you know, one of the newer things in, in, that I've been working on is expanding that support to other grid controllers and just improving the controller experience in general. And um, in a sense, bringing it back to when I first started and I was using hardware. Boy, there's a lot of stuff. First of all, uh, suit and tie guy rearing his head. That's hilarious. I want to get him on the podcast at some point. But what is it? Uh, 
What is it about coding, about programming, that was such a draw for you even when you were like a teen? Well, see, it was a bit of a mystery because you've got this machine that, that does things and, you know, there's just this curiosity about how does it work. You know, it was before the Internet and it was, was really well known at all, you know. Um, I think it was around in some form. And I'm not quite sure. I latched on to it. You know, there's this uh, thing that happens if you, if you actually start writing code, you, you, it's this little puzzle and you figure it out and you get something to happen and you're like, that's cool. You know, well, can I get it to do this? And you, you do it a little more and you get it to do something else. Right. And there's a little bit of this Pavlov effect, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so you just, you get kind of hooked. Now, you'll do things and it will break. You know, something right. bad will happen. And that can be very frustrating. Um, but I think in the end, the thing that, that, that made me stick with it is that uh, you can come up with things in your head, you know, these, these designs for things. And uh, it's almost like, a, a, you know, an architecture, a building in your head. And, uh, and if that idea is um, a musical idea or, or if you're a painter, a painting idea, then that's how you express that. And if the idea is more about a, you know, in this, you know, a process or being able to do something, then writing code allows you to express that. There, there seems to be a pretty interesting correlation when you find people who are uh, interested in both musical composition or artistic composition as well as coding. If they actually have an interest in both, it's kind of also then interesting how um, both sides of the coin start to look like each other. So what you'll see is, uh, you know, so like with programming, a lot of times you do things, something breaks, you fix it up a little bit, and then you, you keep on working on that until, until, it, until it works properly. You see a lot of those people kind of composing the same way, you know, try something that catches their fancy and then tweak it and then move on and do another thing. And, and conversely, um, the way that they code tends to be uh, tends to be a little more artistic and tends to be a little more fanciful than, you know, someone who's like banging out Oracle database code. Or at least that's the way I like to imagine it. Maybe because I self-identify that way. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's a great way to describe it, you know. Um, I haven't written any Oracle database code, but... Oh, good um, for you. You know, <laughs> And uh, there, there is definitely this thing about coming up with an idea and then doing something to realize it, and and then taking that and and going back and forth over and over again, you know. And um, in, invariably, when I get involved with the, with the musical thing, it, I I want it to be based around some kind of an improv, you know, improv. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I have a, a buddy who comes over and he plays guitar, and I'll play some guitar, and I'll do sequences of things, and and it's it's all pure improv, and uh, it's fantastic, but it's 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 difficult and kind of draining. You're done. You're, you know, it's 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 amazing, and then you're done. You're like, oh, I'm exhausted. Right. But it, it, you know, with, with code, it is kind of the same thing. Is it? I I'm, I work alone mostly. I'm at home. Mm -hmm. um, over time, it can be very, very easy to not do what you should be doing. So the way right. that I get myself to focus is I think about, okay, what are all the things that, are, that, I, that, that need to be done? And I'll, I'll pick something and say, what can I do to get excited about this? And sometimes it can be something very simple, you know, like, oh, what if I tried, you know, drawing this button a different way, you know, or doing something. And, sure. Okay, I'll try that. Something really small. You know, I'll go and I'll try that, and, and then I'll get feedback by running the program, and then I can go back to it and go over and over and iterate it. Um, the nice thing is that, of course, is that, that, you know, by the time you're done, you have something, and then you can take that and then something else you built the day before and combine them and keep going. And, uh, you know, the thing that's always been hard for me artistically is finishing something. <laughs> I was um, just, just going <laughs> to go there, because one of the things that amazes me, and, and this is a case for me. And um, I get this sense from you as well. It's it's that um, actually the process of releasing code somehow seems easier than releasing music. And how does that happen? I yeah, that's a very good question. Um, 
And, you know, there, there have been music profit projects I've finished, um, but they were always tied to, they, well, they have to be tied to a deadline. So performance is a good way to, to, to force yourself to finish, or at least get it to a point where it's sort of finished. Right. Um, you know, I mean, software is never finished either. So, um, you know, I think I think part of the thing about doing a release is you, you, you set some goals, and if you once you meet those goals, you say, okay, I, that's, that I can release it. Um, whereas if it's an artwork, you know, it, you, you kind of know once you're done, you're probably not going to come back to it. Uh, I guess, you know, there are some, there are some people that kind of do the same musical piece over and over again. Um, but I, until you said that, I hadn't realized that one of the big differences is there can be a version three of the software. If you try and put out version three of your music release, you're going to get hit on the head by with a stick. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, recently I went. I went to Portland to visit a friend. It was terrible weather. It there was a snowstorm. Basically, the whole city was shut down. And uh, and there was. I think there was going to be uh, a centimeter or something. You know, a relatively impromptu one. Oh yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, it didn't happen. So we're we're you know so we. We sat and you know at his place, and he's like, "Well, let's 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 hook up our stuff and make some music." You know, I brought a small modular, and I had the laptop and so forth. Okay. So we hooked it up, and we we started just goofing around, and we kind of came up with an idea, and and I let him drive because it's his it was his space, and and he had most of the equipment, and and I was really curious to see how he worked because this is someone I know I've known for years who has finished quite a bit of work, mm-hmm. and uh, we worked for several hours late into the night, and had some very interesting things. And the next day he was like, okay, I want to finish that track. You know, I don't want to work on a different track. I want to, and I don't want to make it perfect. I just want to finish it. And, and we did. And, and it was, you know, enlightening to me to see how you can work and still have some improv. And we started to complete improv, but at least we had some idea, right. you know, and, uh, we finished a track and, so, you know, I'm still kind of digesting that and say, okay, how do I incorporate that into this project I have with a buddy of mine and we've been doing, you know, pure improv stuff for ages. And uh, I think part of it is, is you, you know, you, you you just get going and you go for a while and then at some point you stop and then you come back and you have to pick something and say, okay, we're going to, we're going to select this piece of music and we're going to finish it. And, you know, we're, we're going to try it. We're going to see how far we get. But uh, it is a different thing because you you, you know say that the, the track is finished. There's not going to be a dot one version, you know. Whereas right. with the software, it's more like well, a, a release is, is a, it's a marketing event, um, <laughs> right. you know. It really is, you know. And there are certain things we want done. You have to have some milestones, but you know, the next day you're just going to keep going. You know, you've had you've had some shows you've done lately in, in Santa Fe, and you had to prepare for those. And, right, but for me, a performance is a different thing because a performance. If anything, a performance is more like a software release because if it doesn't go well, I can kind of shrug my shoulders and say, well, I'm going to get another chance at this, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, where a recording, not not so much. I, like you, am really focused on improv, and so that adds a lot of extra risk factor to the process <laughs> as well. You make it sound like this friend of yours in, in Portland actually is sort of skilled at taking at coming back the next day and doing what he imagined as a finishing process. I mean, what did that look like? So you did some improv and you kind of got some neat yeah, things that yeah. were, that were a framework. What did it look like to take that material, come to it the next day and finish it? What did, what, what did that look like? Okay. So, well, part of what made it work is we, we picked a model and, 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 you know, we kind of started with, I think it was like a, a, a bumpy baseline, and we were in, you know we were kind of bummed out because of the weather, so we wanted something cheery. So we, we, it was snow day techno, and we kind of ended up in an area that we thought sounded like some early underworld tracks. Mm-hmm. And you know, so that was kind of the model. And and I had a sequence that was uh, almost a TB three hundred three type baseline, but I was running it through some make noise module so I could make it sound a little more like a 303 or like something else. Right. And he had um, this crazy undulating sample going into the computer and he had a, a, a short buffer and he's resampling and playing chords out of it. And so you get this huge pad sound. So those were kind of our starting components. 
you know, we, we, we iterated on those for a while to come up with some variations. We took a break and said, okay, this is what we're doing. You know, we're, we're going to do a, a, a nice, easy to listen to techno track. It's not going to be super elaborate. And then I, I, I pretty much let him take the reins in terms of what the arrangement was like. So, you know, one thing he wanted to do was a, a, a big tempo modulation in the introduction and a certain fade out. So I let him take over in terms of what the arrangement is going to be. Sure. And then I was, you know, I was manning the little modular with the bass line on it, and he added a, a couple modules with drum hits. Uh, we had the sampler going, and um, it was one of those things where we basically ended up doing full passes of the whole track. So that kind of goes back to when I was in high school band or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, they give you a new piece of music, and you stumble through it a couple times, and then you know it, and then you know, they're going to make a recording, you know, and, and it kind of comes together. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and, uh, you know, some of the recordings are better than others. And, you know, we, we kind of got a take we were really happy with, and we mostly stuck with that. Okay. Um, and, and he set some rules. There was, there was going to be no editing. So that really helps. <laughs> right. You know, so if you know, you can't edit, then, you know, you're doing a full take. It's for real. Right. You can't go back and, and tweak notes. This is the take. And then um, we did maybe four takes total. And and by then, you kind of know the song. So I think that's a big part of it, is you go through the whole thing at once. So you, you start to know it, right? And and there'll be certain points in the song where, you know, because I was, I was writing all kinds of knobs on the modular, you know, in real time. And, uh, and there was a really interesting part where he had set up uh, a slew control on his system, Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, he had independent control over rise and fall on the slew, and that was controlling pitch on my system. So we're both controlling the same part of the song at that point. Okay. Um, and uh, and and you know, it, it it took a few tries to get it right, and then we had a one where just everything clicked, and and that was it for that. Um, so I, you know, I I think one thing about it was we had not only did we have the restriction that you know we're going to finish the next day, but Okay, we're not going to edit. It's not going to be more than three and a half minutes. Um, you know, we're not going to add all these other parts we might add. Um, we're not going to make it perfect. You know, we're we're just going to make something that that sounds fun. Right. You know, the, the not editing is kind of a very liberating item. Well, I want to I, I want to actually did. talk about that a little bit too because yeah. if we go to, if we take a look at the way numerology works. It actually is an environment that really works best in a no edit kind of zone, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Particularly because you know, there's you can record audio and you can record MIDI, but it's basically just stems, right? It goes straight right. to the file. You don't see a waveform. There's no editing like that. Um, and you know, you you build the patterns and you can do a live arrangement. And and one of the new things in Numerology Four is you can record that arrangement, but. Um, it is definitely, you know, along the lines of, uh, you know, and maybe this is just me personally because I tend to not finish these tracks, is, you know, having the things that people typically use to finish them, you've got to go to some other piece of software for that. Right. And, and, and but, it, you know, yeah, I mean, there, there's that, you know, you can build everything you need for a live set, and you can run through it as a live set, um, but you are kind of forced that you have to go through the whole thing if you want to get a clean recording of it. Well, yeah, and especially since it has sort of like these pseudo-generative things where you can set up, you know, gate sequences, different length than the pitch sequence and stuff like this, it has a tendency to uh, make stuff that either isn't repeatable or just repeats so seldom that you you, you kind of have to capture it when it happens. Otherwise, you might never get there again. Indeed, yes. You know, I mean, and, and, and those are the things that I think keep you on your toes, right? Because you know that every once in a while, there's going to be this, this little something extra that comes along. You right, know? And, right. you know, I always wanted it so that you can build it and then it becomes almost its own performer. And then you're, you're interacting with it. You know, it's, it's not like you, like, hammered out this chord progression, like, five times and you mm-hmm. recorded it and looped it and now you're soloing on top. It's a little different from that. Now, when this first came out, so you said that, that Numerology version 1 came out sort of as a result of OS ten two. There wasn't a lot of modular gear floating around at that time. 
You know, this was this is prior to the current explosion of modular gear. Absolutely. And um, I remember my first uses of it was uh, with software synthesis uh, solely, in fact. Um, did you at the time have a modular system or were you just trying to bring something that you remember from modular systems into the digital world? I, I, I actually did have one. Um, and it was a, a mix of Bilfer and analog systems modules. Okay. And uh, a Bilfer MIDI CV box. I still have them all, almost all of them. It was, you know, it was it was a it was a, a really good learning experience because I would, when I first had it set up, I didn't have numerology and and there wasn't and you can you know you could run a MIDI sequencer into the CV box and do that but uh, the, the most fun I had was just start with a modular and some cables and start plugging things in and to see if you could build something that is that sounds like a, an, a, an arrangement a piece instead of just a drone or or burbling and. You know, it was very enlightening. I actually never had a hardware sequencer with that particular setup. Uh Um, You know, we were using a variety of things. I I used Korg Z1 for a while. Sure. Um, You know, uh, a couple of times I was using the, there's a sequencer in the Kima system. I've used that with it. And, you know, to some extent, I think part of it was just Eric telling me about the details of how, like, the Moog 960 works. Mm -hmm. You know, it has skip steps and this, and you can do this, and you can do that. I'm like, well... Wow, I want to be able to do that. You know? Right, and, right. You know, it, you know, this was three or four years before you start to see the Moog format modules from from SynthTech and Synthesizers dot com, and uh, you know, so I started building kind of based on that and some things I'd seen in Reactor and other places, and uh, you know, and then Robert Rich started touring with his big modular system, and you know, we watched how he used that and. Uh, and then, yeah, at some point it just, you know, I, I used the small modular for a while and then still used it, but kind of moved away to different things. You know, how you tend to migrate from one set of tools to another. Sure. And, and then, yeah, the next thing you know, there's this huge explosion of, of new Eurorack manufacturers and Moog format manufacturers in the U.S. And it's, it's amazing. So now I have a new system that it complements the old system and it's smaller and I can travel with it more easily. Mm-hmm. And I... I use um, an expert sleeper ZS4, which I run ADAT for my uh, my computer interface, and um, you know I, I actually run neurology CV signals directly through that. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know because I'm partially because I like to have a compact system, and just to be cheap, I don't want to have you know I don't really have an LFO module because I'll run it in numerology and then speed sync, and then I'll use say a couple of those and a couple of CV sequencers and feed those into the modular set up hardware controls for everything and then I don't really feel like I'm using a computer I just I've got all these tools and they you know I have direct access right well it is it does seem like uh, one of the things that you've done with numerology especially with this uh, with the grid connection uh, with launch editing or whatever is you've made it so you can interact with the software without necessarily having to dwell all the time at looking at the screen. Now I don't I don't actually use the grid controller. When I use it though, what I do do is I set up a lot. I use the preset system a lot, mm-hmm. and then set it up so that I have the ability to do a lot of triggering of presets. And then I'll turn away from the computer and I'll just have this preset preset triggering as something I can do with my right hand occasionally, while the rest of the time is spent manipulating the modular. I love working that way. It's it's fantastic. But that's just one of the one of the ways to to interface with this stuff. Beyond what you would like to make for yourself, where do you get the most information about uh, things to add or things to develop for the software? Almost always from the users, or you know, from my own users, or I you know I go to a workshop or a club somewhere and I see people doing interesting things. Um, but a lot of the features you see, particularly in numerology four, are basically user requests. You know, either direct requests that, you know, like the support for the Ableton push was a, a big request. Uh-huh. And it's very natural because it's a, it's a grid controller and you, and you get some knobs. Right. So I can map some things to the knobs. It, it, there's always this back and forth. And I have a really great bunch of users. And they're they're, they're always doing, you know, things that are like, wow, you, that's an interesting way to do that, you know? Yeah. 
Um, the re- you know, I guess one of the reasons I wanted to ask is because, like, when we were talking about doing music, you found it very advantageous to work with somebody else who would add to the add to the process of, of making a piece of work. Uh, mm-hmm. But you also pretty much described yourself as kind of like sitting in your home cutting the code yourself. You know, I know from watching your forums, which unfortunately I can't find a way to sign into, you do interact with the forums a lot. I know that. Do you do you go out to clubs a fair amount or uh, go to performances, that kind of thing? I try to go regularly. Not as, you know, I mean, Albuquerque's not that busy a town. Um, but if there's something going on here uh, that is even remotely electronic related, I'll definitely go and check it out. You know, in, in, in L.A., I definitely made a point of going out and seeing a couple shows. And something else that I'm finding, you know, very inspirational is the, the, the modular synth community, particularly the synth meet that are going on. Right. And, you know, the energy is just so intense, you know. And um, it's, I mean, a bit of a disadvantage there because a lot of them are like, well, we don't use computers at all. <laughs> you know, some people are like, yeah, we use computers and we're fine and it's all good. You know, some are like, oh, I'm not using a computer. You know? Right. Um, and, but some of them are like, well, we, we use iPads, you know? Um, so that helps inform me, you know, right. um, because I want to do something for an iPad. I'm not quite sure. Obviously it would be some kind of sequencer, but it, you know, is it going to be numerology? Is it going to be something else? I don't know. Um, so yeah, I definitely try and get out. I probably don't get out as much as I should. Um, and I don't follow a lot of the online forums at other sites as much as I should, but I, you know, I'm always getting this kind of regular stream of, of bits and pieces from the users, and particularly if there's some new controller that comes out, um, you know, they, they, there could be an announcement, and before I've even read my inbox, they're like, "Hey, are you going to support the push?" And I'm like, "What's, what's that?" <laughs> oh, it was announced an hour ago. Right, um, right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Oh, maybe I will. And, and, I did. and um, you know, and, and the, you know, and the, I try to spend a lot of time like backing away from it. You know, get away from it for a couple of days, go do something else, um, and then come back at it as not as you know, this has been my job for a while. But you know, what is this? Why am I doing this? What's cool about it? What needs to be fixed? Sure. Um, and that's that's a pretty good thought experiment because it. it it helps me rearrange things so that, you know, if, if a stranger's coming in and looking at it, how can I make it easier for them to get into it? Um, you know, and, and with the new release, a lot of that has to do with making it more livable as, as a working environment. Um, you know, it's been, all the crazy stuff is still there, and there's a little more crazy stuff, but I'm also trying to make things a little, little easier to live with. Uh, managing presets, uh, loading and saving pieces of projects, that sort of thing. Right. Well, um, I think a fair number of people that listen to uh, my podcast probably have uh, some sort of background with coding. And I think it's uh, it would be interesting to get your view of sort of like the creative coding process. But since, since what you're doing is a lot more sort of commercial level than what most people would, I think it'll also be interesting to kind of dive into what you find hard. Um, so I had a talk with David Ziccarelli some time ago, and, and we were talking about when he first started doing, um, doing software for music. Uh, and one of the really difficulties at that time was coming up with anything that was even close to a stable clocking system, right? There just there was nothing on the operating level system that was going to help you out with that at all. And so, you know, it was a really difficult process to get something something going on that. When you started getting into developing software for music and particularly something like you do, which is a sequencer that has heavy timing requirements, you're doing audio recording, you're interfacing with hardware, um, you're doing, you know, you actually have, um, you have different effect systems that you've written that are tightly integrated. What is the hardest thing for you to work with? Overall, the, the, probably the two biggies, and this is true for all audio programming, is, uh, is living with a multi-threaded environment, which means that 
the you know the computer can be running different parts of the code at the same time, and it can jump between them at any time. Um, and that's just it, it, it's a mindset, you know. And and I, the inside of numerology is, is set up to supposedly make it easier for me to understand that. But sometimes you, you look at something and you're like, well, wait, what's going on here? I know it works, but <laughs> how does it work? And uh, the other one, which is closely related to that, is when you're doing something that's audio related. So I'm generating, well, or, or sequencing related, because of the, that whole subsystem runs at the same time. So I'm generating notes or CVs or processing them or feeding them to an audio unit or doing my own audio processing is that there's this whole list of things that, you know, as a programmer working in other realms are perfectly fine. You simply can't do as an audio programmer. So you can't allocate memory. You you can't write to a file. All these things, you can't do them on the particular piece of code that's generating stuff. Right. Um, and, you know, it's a pretty big limitation. And, you know, you just, you just learn to live with it. The timing bit... That's not hard in, in terms of running standalone, and, and, and credit for that has to go to the OS10 audio team because there's very accurate timing information you get from the audio driver that comes in directly to the app. It's you know it's nanosecond accurate or near net, you know it's sub millisecond accurate, and you can use that to schedule MIDI events. So running standalone, that's pretty easy. When interfacing with other software becomes very difficult for a, a variety of different reasons, and actually probably even more than the, the threading stuff, that's the hardest one, is, uh, you know, the, the, the plug-in specifications are reasonably well specced out in terms of what they expect you to do, but they don't cover all the side cases. You know, there's always some little surprise somewhere, and every host is a little different, and all the plugins are a little different, and, you know, it just takes a lot of time to get to know what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and numerology in particular, it's tricky because it's not a synthesizer. So it's, it's, it's primary job for the way most people use it is to generate MIDI. And they're like, oh, I want to use this with Pro Tools and so forth. So, Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that, but, but you're making a plug-in that's very different from what most plug-in people are trying to accomplish. Right. And, you know, there's some built-in audio stuff, but... Uh, as a plugin, it's primarily used as a step sequencer to feed somewhere else. And for VSTs, it's great because VSTs, almost every VST host I've ever seen, in fact, everyone I think I've seen is, supports MIDI output. And, and the, the nature of the API makes sure it's accurate and the latency is very you know, minimal. Um, on the audio unit side, the, the spec supports MIDI output, but a lot of the hosts don't, don't use that part. So you use an IAC bus and now you have some latency and it's a good bit harder to generate accurate timing information for sending the MIDI. Um, it's still pretty good. It's just not as good as if, say, you're using a VST enabled right. and you know. Um, and then, and there's, there's just so many different permutations on it. Um, you know, in Logic X, Apple now has, uh, at least uh, if you're on Mavericks, um, the MIDI effect plug-in. And now they support, and in that case, they support MIDI output from the plugin, and you, so you get very, very good timing. Yeah, um, I actually just downloaded that and tried that out last night. I was really amazed that it even worked. And the thing is, is that the trouble I had getting that to work wasn't just transmitting the MIDI bit. There was some other little thing in the code where, I don't know, I didn't have the right preprocessor defined or, or some subclass hook or something, and um, I wasn't getting MIDI input. Oh, you know, and it right. took a while to figure out, oh, this a little inconsequential piece of code that's been there for, for five years, I have to change it slightly. Um, you know, those are the things that make you crazy. Sure. Uh, but, you know, you, you, you do it and you get it out and, and it, you know, you start getting emails like, oh, I love the MIDI effect. I'm just crazy about it, finally. <laughs> you know? So that makes, that's what makes it worthwhile. Right. So um, you have chosen to focus on having this run on uh, Mac only. Uh, no desire to to take a fire at Windows or, you know, maybe even more interestingly, Linux? So the issue is always, well, when I started, I, I wrote, I even actually started all Objective-C because, uh, you know, OS X is what I knew yeah. and... The tools were there, and they, you know, Objective C is the language. And I, I already knew Smalltalk and some other things, uh, you know, C++ and so forth. So I'm like, yeah, Objective C sounds fine. And then I ran into some issues, and 
you know, it worked okay, but not great. And then I decided, okay, I'm going to split it in half. Half the, the, the back end stuff is all C++ and the front end is all Objective-C. So in terms of porting to Windows, there is this major issue that, you know, there is an Objective-C compiler and you can even get a certain amount of all the Cocoa classes on there. Right. But it's still an unfamiliar environment. And regardless of the time it takes to port it, once I've got it on Windows, then, you know, there's this obligation to support those users. <laughs> and, you know, it's not that I don't want to do it. It's just that I have to balance things out. And Well, and yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, there has to be a thing where you have to love what you're doing, too. I mean, this is one of the, I think maybe it's one of the things that, that you have... Uh, available to you that's really cool is because it's a one-man shop and because you define what it is that you're creating you get to decide what the limits are and um, you know if one of them is that you enjoy working with the Macintosh in a way that you don't enjoy working with Windows that's the limit you get to set and so maybe in a way it's how why numerology has a tendency to seem more like a, an artwork than a commercial program, if you don't mind me yeah, saying. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it really is. You know, I mean, it's, I'm not in it for the money. You know, that's, that it took me a long time to realize that that really wasn't important. You know, uh -huh. that, that, you know having it be a real product and sustain itself, that's important. But, yeah. um, you know, it, 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 I'm not trying to take over an industry, you know, by any means. So, you know, and, the, and but then you run it, you know, and I want to stay as a single man shop or maybe, you know, one or two others, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. occasional thing. Um, so I have to think carefully about how time is allocated. And so right. if I were to stop, you know, I could stop now, I could start porting the windows, maybe it'll come out next year and then I'm doing a lot of support. So all the current users invariably are going to suffer a bit because I won't be taking care of them as well. Um, you know, I'm playing around a bit with some iOS code, and that's a lot easier in terms of porting. It's still a good bit of work, right? Um, but it's 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 still very much a familiar environment, um, and that process also makes it easier to eventually get to maybe Windows or or possibly even Linux. Although the interesting thing about Linux for me isn't really a full blown computer, but the fact that you can do embedded systems with it. Yeah, I've actually started playing around with that uh, little microprocessor systems running Linux. Got to tell you, it's pretty exciting stuff. There's some oh, neat, it's amazing. there's some neat stuff out there for a hundred bucks. Yeah, or, or even fifty. Or even fifty, you know? right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so, that's cool. So there's that kind of leads me into the next question I had, which is, what is out there that makes you like really excited to? to try and do the next thing. I mean, is there, besides these little microprocessor boxes, is there bits of hardware that you would really like to wrap your head around? Or are there interface tools that you'd like to find a way to integrate into numerology? Or is there like a completely different paradigm you're interested in exploring? Well, one thing that I'm really looking forward to is I, I ordered a sound plane from Madrona Labs. Yeah. And, you know, this is this amazing touch controller, and um, it's, I, I used it for a little bit last year. I, you know, I was in Seattle, went to visit, and I was just amazed at how sensitive it is as a controller. I mean, you, can, you can rest your finger on it and wiggle it just a little bit, and it will pick it up. And it's, it's a good size, um, and it's all OSC-based. You know, it sends out this, this huge data stream of OSC events. You know, if you're, you can use up to, I think, 10 fingers. Mm -hmm. And each finger is, you can send three different, uh, four different dimensions. And, um, you know, there's some OSC support in numerology, and I keep trying to update it and make it more robust. And, but, you know, I don't think it's quite ready to handle the full data rate directly. And, and I'm not even quite sure how to use it, you know, other than piping it to a, to a software instrument. Right. Um, so that's something that I'm really excited to, to, to get and to use for myself, but also to use it as a, a motivator to improve that area of numerology, even though that's about as esoteric as it gets, right, Abby, you know. It is, um, although I was, I was really interested to see that the, the expert sleepers people have embraced it as, a, you know, as something that they support directly. And I'll tell you, having used one myself, it is the most instrument-like interface 
You know, maybe the only thing close to it is the uh, Snyder Phonics Manta, which similarly puts out a huge data stream, right? It also is like very peculiar as uh, very much an approachable instrument. You start working with those and you start really seeing the limits of what we've imagined software to do. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure I exactly understand what to do better. You know, this is, I, I mean, I do like the fact that Randy with the sound plane, you know, because he kind of controls his, controls the alto environment, he can sort of, and the Kaivo environment, he can sort of build in some interesting support in that software. But I mean, unless everybody's going to cut their own Macs or processing code or whatever, it seems like an awful lot of data gets stripped out of it before it ever gets to the point of being in your musical world. Yeah, well, you know, the, the bulk of the market is based around uh, the, the big DAWs and plugins that work with those. Mm-hmm. And that that whole metaphor was, you know, oh, it's a whole recording studio on your computer. Right. And that's fantastic, but there, there seems to be kind of this stick in the mud factor that like, <laughs> this is how this stuff works. You know, yeah. you record audio, you record MIDI, you feed MIDI to your plugins, you have instrument tracks, you free things, you bounce things. You know, the routing is linear. That's how it works. You know, and and that's kind of where I ended up where I am. Is I, you know, I, it, it's great for certain things, but it's not what I want to use to write music with. Well, it's interesting you say that because one of the things that, that I find interesting is when – boy, I use the word interesting so much. But that's because I get talking to someone like you and everything all of a sudden is interesting. So I apologize <laughs> for that. But um, one of the things that I find curious is that when I first started with you know computers and MIDI and uh, sequencing programs – it was a tiny, tiny minority of musicians and computer owners. And so there wasn't much of a market and everybody was like, oh yeah, well, you know, it's a labor of love and we're going to do it. And it slowly built, built some momentum. But, you know, there was a time when uh, probably, you know, I was one of the first 20,000 people that was doing MIDI sequencing with samplers and keyboards and stuff right all right at least i like to guess that that's the case um now you know at i think when ableton announced the push they also at that same time said something like over four million people had been using ableton live you know had a copy of ableton live which is just shocking but also it sort of says all right this has kind of gone mainline but now there's but now what we're seeing is that there's a new there are several new groups kind of like micro communities cropping up around things like modular synthesis or um, creative coding or whatever. There are all these little things cropping up that are saying, you know, uh, doing beats on a DAW just doesn't work or isn't interesting or isn't you know, doesn't drive my creativity the way I'd like it to. And so I'm going to jump into this other thing, which I think is cool. I think it's really exciting. And, and, you know, luckily I get the opportunity to teach that a little bit at the, at a local college. I definitely get to engage with people, you know, through cycling 74. Um, but I also, I'm a fan of this stuff. And so I run into them at synth meets and stuff like that. It's really exciting but i'm i'm already starting to sense you know that now this is getting to be a fairly big and kind of common thing and i wonder what like the next underground bits and pieces are going where they're going to come from i don't know maybe it maybe it is from things like the sound plane and these data rich environments that force you to go to back and have to learn how to interact with an instrument I don't know. What do you think? What do, what do you think is the thing that develops the next community, the community that doesn't exist yet? Well, I think, you know, definitely there's always some piece of technology that, that kind of leaks into, you know, as, as a musical application, right? And, um, you know, it, it, and sometimes it takes a while. So OSC has been around for a while, but we're just now starting to see 
a little bit more traction in terms of instruments using LSD instead of MIDI. And the, the software, as you said, hasn't caught up yet. You know, right. there's a lot, not a lot of, you know, and and it's kind of a wild west in terms of how you connect the two and how you <laughs> come up with a workable solution and, and all those things. That, you know, but often that challenge is what leads you onto a path that you weren't going to expect, you know. Um, you know, as opposed to if you download a big DAW and you start working to build with the built-in sounds, you're going to probably end up someplace where you expect it to be, um, which, you know, is often what you want. But if you're really looking to kind of explore and get lost, you do kind of want to work with something you're, you're not quite sure how you're going to get it to work. Right. Um, you know, and the community thing is, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know. I mean, the, there's certainly plenty of interesting things still in the modular community. And, and you know, we touched a bit on embedded systems. And um, I was talking with somebody just the other day, and, and we were talking about Arduinos and LEDs and controlling them and so forth. And he said, yeah, I've got a, you know, a module with an Arduino in it. And I, I'd seen the module, but I didn't think much about it. You know, and I went back and looked at it again. And I'm like, okay, there's all kinds of crazy things that could happen based on this particular item. Yeah. And, it, and it kind of combines the two communities between the creative coding community and the hardware community. Uh, you know, just to, to fill it out a bit, what, we were, what I was, you know, he was talking about adding LEDs and some kind of visual performance element to his modular system. Right. And, um, I had been playing around with the Arduino and LEDs in terms of, uh, you know, making some kind of controller or, or something, or maybe part of an art project or something, just goofing mm-hmm. around. And I thought, hmm, let's see, how could we have CV signals coming into an Arduino and then coming out and driving a, a chain of color LEDs directly? Right. You know, and, you know, and, and, and those things just kind of pop up randomly, right? Yep. You know, you're talking to somebody or, or something, and... Um, so I have to make some notes and figure out, you know, <laughs> when's, when's a good time to play hooky and try and get something running. Right. Know? Yeah, it's uh, the, the Arduino <laughs> thing is really fun, too, because unlike what you were talking about in coding, uh, you know, and some of the things you have to deal with in a multi-threaded environment, there's none of those issues when you're working with an Arduino. You know, there's no operating no. system. You literally, when you say, hey, do this thing, it just sort of like says, okay, can I do it on the hardware? Yeah, okay, let's do it. Let's do it right now. <laughs> you know? And it's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome to not have any barriers sort of between your code and the hardware. It's a lot of fun. It is. It's, it, it was pretty nice. You know, because I, I got started with a kit and, you know, specifically I was interested in doing LEDs, but I had uh-huh. several other little servos and things and just ran through the examples. You know, right. And, Coding wise, it's you know it's easy to pick up, and then I, it, it just kind of click. It's like oh, you, you you write this loop, you know, you initialize stuff, and then you write this loop, and it just runs as fast as it can, and that's it. You right, know, right. that's not that's all there is. You read your inputs, you generate your outputs, and it's like okay, this is you know because I stayed away from it for years because you know I embedded this blah blah that, and um, but, you know at one point I was writing some code for a DSP, you know, just because I just had to. And, mm-hmm. Um, it drove me nuts. Oh, yeah. um, and, you know, so I, the embedded stuff turned out to be a lot more interesting and easier to live with than I thought it was. So now it's kind of like, okay, you know, make a couple little, like, just, you know, personal projects, a couple controllers and things, and then see where that leads. Right. Well, there's there's the whole set, the whole issue of tool chains, too, you know. you've You've been doing this as longer longer than I have and you know that it used to be that um, the, the idea of free programming tools is a relatively recent uh, thing you know it used to be that well if you wanted to get into developing on a Mac you had to pour a bunch of money into that and then if you wanted to do Windows you had to pour money into that and God help you if you wanted to get into an embedded system you had to dump a bunch of money more into development tools for that and so, oh, yeah. you know, it's only been in the last couple of years that all of these tool chains all of a sudden started showing up for free. And, man, that gives you a lot more ability to just say, I'm going to dip a toe in this and see what it feels like. Yeah, I mean, it, it used to be that, you know, the, the, the Beagle Bone and the Raspberry Pi use these, these relatively powerful ARM chips and very, very, you know, very, very inexpensive boards. Right. And, you know, I know when the Beagle board in particular, the, the first iteration was two or three hundred bucks, and then they dropped it to forty-four, and now they're back up to maybe fifty or so. And it, yeah, it used to be it was an evaluation board, you right, know, and they're right. like going to charge you a 
two thousand dollars for you know fifty dollars in components just right. because they can and and um you know the whole DIY electronics thing is is made them reevaluate and go oh you know there's there's some competition from these smaller groups and um you know they have all these chips that they make zillions of for cell phones so there's a, there's a bit of a trickle down all so, right and it, you know because it yeah, four years ago, you, you look at what you can do on, a, on an iPod Touch or an iPad, and it's so much compared to trying to do embedded anything that it's it's like, oh, okay, but now it's a little different. You know, now you can get an embedded system that has a comparable amount of power, and it's, it's cheaper, and you can even add a screen, and it's not too bad. Um, right, yeah, I was pretty surprised the first time I got a Raspberry Pi, and I... So, oh, it's got HDMI connection. I plug something in, and it lights up with a whole graphic UI, you know, for $35. I'm like, yeah. that's crazy. I think there's still a lot of room to explore there. It, it used to be if you wanted to put out a piece of hardware for music, you know, it was a, a, a big thing, right? right? You know, big projects and a big budget, and it's $1,000 because it's only a certain market size. And, and now there's, like, this whole range of things, depending on... You know, you can just do a module, and you can hand build your own circuit boards, and you could put it out for a hundred bucks. Or, you know, you can do a hardware sequencer, and you know, you can go like just crazy with it and sell a few for a grand or two, and everything in between. Right. Yeah, it's stunning. Well, I'm using up a lot of your time. I really appreciate you sticking with me. I'm uh, before we go, I want to hear a little bit about numerology four. Uh, Three has been out for a long time. I know you're baiting four. I've been using the beta a little bit. Um, not a little bit, a fair amount. But um, I see a lot of things changing there. Why don't you fill us in on what numerology four is going to introduce? The most visible change is uh, more hardware support. Um, it supports the launch pad like numerology three, but you can have as many as you want. Um, I've had, like I think, five up at once. Um <laughs> Hey, oh, it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> it I sounds get, I insane. Get going. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, because, you know, it, it, when, you, when you start to add more and more, then it's like, well, each one can be its own part. So you got one for your drums and one for a bass and one sure. for another synthesizer and one for presets. Um, or you you can just, you know, set them all up so it's one big sequence, you know, and then you just got lights going crazy. But, um, so that's, but that's a practical issue. And then uh, support for the push and the ohm. I'm working on hopefully getting support in for the APC series so you can have uh, some controller that's, that's relatively well set up for mixers. So you have bank switching and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, in the UI, the big change is uh, what I just called a browser. And it'll you know be familiar to anyone who's used Ableton or a lot of other programs. Is the left-hand side, there's now one integrated browser between um, your modules. All the presets for those modules that you make yourself are now all in one place. Um, you can export and import stacks, and there's a whole separate area for those. There's a browser for audio files, and you know that that will continue to be leveraged as a as a, as a workflow improvement. Um, it's 64 bit. Uh, that's obviously very important these days. Um, the audio unit MIDI effect is very very important for anybody who uses Logic. Uh, they have to be on the latest Logic on on Mavericks or later, uh, but it works pretty well. A lot of little things I, I tend to forget about that are still a pretty big deal. There's there's uh, undo redo for a lot of operations. There's uh, the OSC API has been extended quite a bit. Um, there's a you know a bunch of things. You know I work on it and work on it and then I'm like well, what was all in this stuff? You know, but I, I really when you get down to it, a lot of it is just workflow improvements. Um, sure. And then there's a few special things. Oh, one thing you know, a big thing is uh, there's a. There's a real-time automation thing, so it's a way to record short gestures from. Uh, you say you've got a, a knob mapped oh, yeah, to right. filter cutoff. Sure. You know, so you can trigger it, and it'll be uh, quantized to a bar, and it'll record for some number of beats, and then loop it, and then you can. It's very simple. There's no editing. You, you record it, and you can let it record, you know, let it play back indefinitely. Uh, you can mute it. You know, you can have it set up for one preset, not for another. That gives you almost like another level of this pseudo ge uh, generative stuff, where you can set up a loop of real time manipulation that might even be separate from your other loops settings. Yes, oh, that sounds yes. cool. You know, that sounds and, really interesting. You know, and I, and I set it up so that it, you can have it fully quantized or completely unquantized. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, so there, there, you know, like a lot of numerology splits between. 
kind of a more traditional step based and you know bass or beats type of thing, or uh, a completely generative abstract type of approach, and it and it and it works either way, you know, depending on what side of that fence you want to sit on, or if you want to combine them. Sure. Um, um, there are lots and lots of little things like uh, there's a chord sequencer in numerology, and it came with a built-in set of like most commonly used chords, and I went through and read everything I could find on lots of different chords, and and added. I think it doubled the number of chords. You know, okay. so there, uh, there are a bunch of ninth chords, eleventh, thirteenth. Sure. Um, changed it so that when you pick a chord, um, or you pick a you, you pick a chord and you pick a scale, it will automatically adjust which chord it picks slightly to make sure it fits the uh, the scale you picked. Oh, okay. Um, sure. You know, so lots lots and lots of little things to kind of like just, just fill in thing make it a lot easier to use. Well, I have to tell you, as a user of the software, one of the most uh, one of the, one of the best things you just said, though, goes back to using a bunch of launch pads, and the fact that you still have fun with your own software. How hard is that? How hard is it to keep? Because you've been doing it what now for? When did the first version come out? Like two thousand five? Uh, no, I think it was even before that. Um, Maybe 2002. I'd have to check. Oh, geez. So uh, it's yeah. well over a decade old then. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that was always the thing. Was that, is that it, it, When I was doing version two, I did a complete rewrite. And it was going to take a while. And I told everybody, look, this is going to take a while. It's not going to be released, but I'm here. You know, this is, this is something I'm going to keep. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's kind of the thing. A lot of companies come and go, but I just, you know, keep chugging away at it. Sure. And, um, you know, and it, it's flexible enough that I can take in a different direction. So over time, I, I, I approach it differently in terms of how I use it myself. Mm-hmm. You know, for a while, I was just using it self-contained. And then, but now I'm much more likely to use it. It's just, it's an extension of the modular. Right. You know, and, and that's how I see it. It's, I've got some hardware controllers and numerology running the modular, but I'm, I'm focused on that. And, and it's more of a, a, almost a plumbing type of thing. So I can take it in either direction. That's cool. All right. Well, this sounds really exciting. I'm sure that uh, everyone out there is going, if they don't already use numerology, uh, go out and check 512. That's F-I-V-E-1-2 dot com. Uh, You can check out the numerology stuff. Um, You'll actually find a lot of the information actually exists on the forum rather than on his static web pages. You got to update those, man. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I, I'm going to do that. I just made a note. I'm going to go and do that this afternoon. I'll take that like, version four. All right, good. But um, I'm really excited to continue to see the stuff that you do. And again, I'm I'm glad to hear that you remain excited not only about uh, not only about the software, but kind of the whole uh, the whole world uh, that all of this lives in. I think it's easy once you start doing it and you start getting paid for it or what that whatever it's also real easy then to start kind of like losing your enthusiasm and excitement for the world of it and i'm just glad to see that you're staying you're staying there that's really great so thanks awesome. thanks again for your time i way blew my time schedule on this i wanted to not be too invasive on you but what the heck it was a great conversation that was great a lot right. of fun. yeah thanks a lot and i'll talk to you again soon all right, take care. Well, that went all over the map, didn't it? I think that was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I certainly did enjoy it. A couple of things I want to do right now. First of all, I want to pimp out a release that I was just a part of. Uh, Gregory Taylor and I just did a duet album called Turbion Solo on the Palace of Lights label. Uh, it features a couple of my friends as sort of uh, side artists as well. So. It was a really cool effort, and it's kind of the thing that Gregory and I do, where he develops very Gamelon-like entities. I work with him from there. Um, It's kind of the opposite of our live work, but it's really pretty interesting in its own right. Um, So you can uh, take a look at that. It's at palaceoflights.com and available at fancy CD shops uh, near you. Um, Beyond that, I want to thank all the people that help out and uh, support the podcast. Shout-outs to Synthopia. Uh, Shout-out to Create 
create digital music, CDM, and Peter Kern's crew there, uh, particularly Marsha. Uh, hey, Marsha, hope things are going well. Um, and finally, I want to thank my employer, Cycling74, for being very uh, accepting of me doing this podcast. So with that, I uh, bid you farewell. See you next week, uh, where we're going to have another great interview. Thanks. Bye.